you can't just apply business principles to architecture. You've got to apply architecture to business approach. It's the other way around, in my opinion. Episode 77. Hello and welcome. My name's Ryan Willard. I'm the host of the Business of Architecture UK and what a delight we have for you today. I am in the Leadenhall building speaking with one of the senior partners of Roger Sturk Harbour and Partners. With I'm speaking to Leonard Grutt, who's got a wealth of experience working and negotiating with international clients on projects of every size and type within RSHP. He's been there for over 30 years. He's seen it grow from the Richard Rogers partnership into RSHP. And this was a real delight for me because I used to work for um, RSHP before they were in the Leaden Hall when back in the days of the Thames Wharf studio so I know the practice quite well um, and it was lovely to see lots of old colleagues and reconnect and to be able to listen to Leonard and understand his perspective on the business aspects of a influential star architect you know architectural firm like RSHP was absolutely fascinating and we talked a lot about how the practice has evolved how it's grown the succession planning um, parts of his own personal career he's been involved in many uh, multilingual environments at RSHP's worked on a variety of uh, projects, a lot of infrastructure projects such as Terminal 5 at Heathrow, Terminal 4 at Baracus Airport which in Madrid, which was the 2006 uh, Sterling Prize winner, um, airports such as Geneva and Lyon. He's also been involved in setting up the practice's new work in places like Mexico, Lebanon, China, South America. So this was really interesting to sort of probe deeply into how RSHP um, grows, how it operates, how it works internationally, how they're able to maintain such high design standards and their kind of vision for the future. And I think one of the quotes that we go into a lot here that um, Leonard was talking about was how RSHP have always strived to apply architectural principles to business rather than applying business principles to architecture. So this is a really, really fascinating conversation. So sit back and relax and enjoy Leonard Grutt of Roger Sturk Harbour and Partners. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Leonard, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you here. Mm -hmm. You're one of the senior partners at Roger Sturk Harbours and Partners. You've been here for about three decades, a bit more, yeah, a bit more, a bit more than that, and that's that's quite a, a legacy. It's quite a contribution to uh, to a business. So I'm quite curious how or how would you describe your role at RSHP? I think to, in order to describe the role, it sort of has to go. I have to go back to the history of my relationship with principally, obviously, Richard. Yeah. Um, because I've known Richard since 19, say 1970, because I was, at that time, I was trained as an engineer. I um, was working with Arabs and I was sent to Paris 
on the Pompidou Center to be responsible for delivering the steelwork structure on the Pompidou Center. So obviously, at that time, <coughs> I worked closely with Peter Rice, for, who obviously was one of the, the key driver behind the Pompidou Center, and built up obviously a relationship with Richard and Renzo in that period. So I knew Richard at that time, and when Pompidou ended, I continued with Arabs for a while in Paris, then left engineering altogether to go to Asia, and I worked on a number of different other things in agro business and a number of other, before coming back to the UK in 85, at which time I regained contact with Richard, and that time, uh, Richard, which was Richard Rogers' partnership at the time, <coughs> had just got a new job in France and asked me whether I would help out on that project mm. because of uh, being a French speaker, etc. <coughs> um, so it all began from me saying, yes, I'll do two days a week. Um, and that was in 1985-86. And now we are in whatever it is, 2019. And so, so that was there. that was around the, the Lloyd's, beginning of Lloyd's. No, to, uh, no, that was towards. I'd say that's towards 85, 86 was towards the end of Lloyd's. Right. Okay. And the office must have been about 40 people, I presume. And uh, work was just beginning to come in elsewhere. So there were other number jobs. Uh, uh, developing, but I think it was Richard was conscious that once he was doing other work, he needed he needed a different way of structuring the office. So mm. that's where I I started. Now coming in as an engineer it sounds very strange because the one thing I said to Richard when I started was the one thing I'm not going to do for this office is engineering because I felt very strongly that what RS, well, today, RSHP, but what was RRP at the time was that always worked with the best external engineers and working with people like Peter Rice, Tom Parker from Arabs, and that I didn't want to find myself in any way in conflict with other engineers. Right. So <clears throat> right from the start, I took on the role more of managing projects ensuring that they are the way they were run, the communication with clients, etc. So engineering was a no-go area as far as I'm concerned. And by that time, I, you know, there were a lot better engineers out there than me. So I think <coughs> that was a very clear view I took. Mm. So the role, if you like, has built from that. Um, essentially, there have been two strands to it. One is generally dealing with jobs outside the UK. Um, I think that we'll come, perhaps talk about that a bit more later on, but I think it's there are a number of factors there that that make it make it um, important to have a I think two strands. One is the the ability to understand what the business is about. Mm. Uh, you can't just apply business principles to architecture, you've got to apply architecture to business approach. It's the other way around, in my opinion. And secondly, it's the, it's the sort of innate DNA that says, I like working in unknown environments. Yeah. There's a sort of, the, it's the opposite to saying, I only feel comfortable dealing with what I know and I know I'm very good at. Yeah, it's the sort of uncertainty that can drive the the um, adrenaline. <clears throat> so I I think that was the sort of that's the sort of background. But that was the the one side of it. Another one that came out of it was we very quickly got involved in airports through T five. Yep, and that airport knowledge well. The first one we got involved with was out in Marseille. That's where I sort of started getting into the airport 
uh, or the air terminal airport design side of it. So I was heavily head, head involved from the start in our airport business, T5. Um, and then we had Baracas, etc. So there was one stream which was very much related to the airport design side of the office. But gradually it's obviously become more the commercial business side of it related 90% mm. to what's a, what non-UK work. So I have a particular interest in our, in our off-site business, which I think is, is very exciting and, and hopefully will come to fruition in the coming months. This is, this is the design for manufacture homes yeah. and housing yeah. that's, that's yeah. been de- um, pioneering. Yeah. You said just now that it's more about applying architectural principles to business, not yeah. business, uh, business principles to architecture. Can yeah. you say a little bit more about that, what that well, means Well, I to think you? it's very easy, and I've sort of noted it, when you sort of move around and look at other practices, and I don't have enough of that, but it's very easy to th- to think you can take someone with a with a business background mm. and apply it to an architectural business or architectural practice, um, and you very quickly well, I think you leave lose the sensibility about what architecture is supposed to deliver, and. I think the, the the art of the business side of it is knowing how to how to deliver the product and make money. Yeah, it's not making money out of the business. It's it's the other way around. It's just right. saying we're an architectural practice. We we want to deliver a product. What is what is the best way of delivering that product, and then and make money. And it's it's that's that way around. I think is is the way you need to think about it. Because right. otherwise you're very easily, well, I will then cover the, another point of it. Yes, you've got to be in a position where you're, you're in a strong enough architectural environment that you can, to a certain extent, ensure that you've got enough money to do the product, which is, I think, is, is, is a more than a subtle difference. Yeah. Because otherwise you're just selling hours. But if, if, if you've got that strength, then it's, it's all about ensuring that you've got enough money to do the product. And then how, how do you manage in to ensure that you're earning the right amount at the right time? And then have enough left over to be able to say, yes, I'll spend that money because I want to make sure that product is the best product that comes out yeah. there. In. So it's, it's, it's that balance, which I think is the, is the challenge in the sort of I think the art of the business, mm. and how and how have you in your career developed that art, or how has how what what, what have been <laughs> well, the, what have the been hard the way basically? <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of starting at the you know starting with project projects and realizing you know where you run into trouble. You know the first projects we were involved with in France, you know I always remember you know we if, with Richard having to go to the client begging for more fees you know, because we. You know, in the end, the, the contracts we had negotiated wasn't me, but had been, <laughs> had been negotiated, just didn't would allow us to deliver, and and we managed to get some more fees. Um, but I think for me, those you know, it's le- those lessons learned that said you've got to be in a position, or you've got to understand where your limitations are. Mm. And I think that is it's just it, one well. Firstly, it's experience. Two, it's the discipline of, of understanding what I always say, the sort of bottom-up cost of doing projects. And the top-down is really the commercial negotiation you can do to ensure you've got more money than you need yeah. in order to make profit and to cover off uncertainties. You don't always get it right. Yeah. But um, that's generally we've done pretty well. And how and when you're going into overseas projects, I mean, yeah. you're taking the same kind of philosophical business approach where uh, the architecture is driving the business. What are the kind of obstacles that you face when you're moving into new economies and new countries? Well, I think they're, they're, they're at all levels. I mean, uh, very often you're moving into environments where fees are low. And I think it's a, 
it's a challenge we we're facing more and more these days. Mm. Um, you know, if you go to if you take China, there is a range where you know, because you're competing with top practices, Zaha, Herzog de Moron, whoever you like, there is a range of fee there that you're going to be lucky to move outside of. Right. Um, but you just you just hit hit the as high as you can in in that range and then it's it is more back to managing your resource um yeah fortunately generally speaking in places like china they're very large projects so they are and they go generally fairly fast so there's a there's a balance there you can find mm. um the other thing one has to identify is that and a number of locations we're brought in, we're invited in by special clients who want a special product. So on many occasions, we've been able to negotiate an adequate, more than adequate fee. So you can you you can cover off for the learning process and the thing the the real um, sort of challenge is is. How much is the learning process going to cost you? Right. Because you'll always make mistakes and understanding the system, the nature of the beast you're dealing with. Um, so th- th- those are all elements that are taken in, you need to take into account. The language. Yeah. Um, and anecdotally, uh, you know, what I've always found interesting is that at some, uh, you know, Funnily enough, one of the most difficult linguistic places I've been to working is the States. Really? <laughs> because you think you're speaking the same language and you're not. Right. I mean, it's sort of slightly anecdotal, but the number of times I've sat in meetings to begin with and you, you sort of you say something and you see this sort of complete blank faces across the table and it's just simply because you think you're speaking... English to each other, but one speaking English, another speaking American, and it's and it's it's easy to misunderstand each other because you think you understand each other. While if you're speaking a, long, a foreign language, you're always concerned about have you understood each other. So you you're paying more attention to it, and you're less surprised when it someone's misunderstood you. Yeah. And how and how do you sort of mitigate, or how do you? kind of mitigate the risks when you're working abroad in terms of those linguistic misunderstandings or in particularly in terms of contract negotiations? Well, I mean, obviously the contract is, is at one level the, the, the easier part of it because you've just got to spend the time, get the translations, get the, you know, you've just got to go painfully through the process. Um, You've also got to realise that the legal situation in countries is very different, and you've mm. got to take a view. You know, while in the UK, you can be satisfied, you can you know exactly where you can go if you want to go legal or what's behind it. <clears throat> yeah, there's many countries where you can feel about going to court. Yeah. So one thing is signing the contract, but then it's the confidence. How do you? How do you manage the contract and how do you manage your fee? And obviously, cash flow is king. Yeah. So if you're outside your comfort zone, you, the art is making sure that you've got the cash flow there. So you, you're never behind. You haven't spent more than you've got in the bank. Mm. And that's a very difficult one to... To ensure happens, but that is the, the the key. If you're outside your comfort zone, if the thing goes pear shaped, you're not actually losing money. Yeah, and this is one. This is one of these issues in all architectural businesses that they often find themselves on this kind of tightrope of cash flow. That often the projects can be so unexpectedly complicated or demand new resource. What sorts of well, how how is the office here at RSHP organised? in terms of making sure that, that, that those kinds of systems and the business of it is managed very efficiently. And, 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 it's, and I sort of ask as well, because RSHP is one of these practices in the UK that has 
given birth to many, many other smaller architectural practices. Mm -hmm. And I kind of get a sense that there's obviously something that you're doing very, very right here that's embedded in the culture of RSHP that has enabled lots of other young practices to start up and kind of take a little bit of that of that DNA. Is that, um, it's interesting. I have no, no one's asked that question, but I, if you sort of just thinking about it, I think it's probably I, I identify two things. One is they're all very talented people. Yeah. So that's probably sort of number one. Um, number two is that you know, we have a rational approach to architecture. And a rational approach to architecture, in my opinion, generates a thinking process which is also rational. Mm. Um, and the people coming from this practice have also witnessed that we run a business at the same time as we run architecture. And I think you know, those three things mean that you know, anybody leaving this practice, starting their own, has, those, has three things to hold on to. And yeah. you know, they realize, they've seen, and it's, we are very public about it, how important we place the business aspect because they've witnessed this in their pay packages, in the, in the um, profit share, yeah. the fact that we are handing money to charities, you know, they've, been, they've been participated in that as well. So that side of it is very much embedded into what we're doing. Without it being the dominating, yeah, we. The, the thing, and it's perhaps a bit arrogant, but the thing I feel most important is that we should be in a position where we've negotiated a, a sufficient fee, that we've negotiated, uh, they're managing the process, that we're not going back to a client every five minutes saying, I want more for this, I want more for that. Yes, we will go back when, yeah, and it's important to be, if there is a change or the, yeah, to, to manage that process carefully, but it's, it's, it's not saying, let's sign the contract and we're gonna make our money out of making fee claims. <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, Which, yeah. And, and that is, for me, one of the fundamentals is that you need to be in a position where you can get on and do, do the job and your question was, if you suddenly need extra resource, you know you've got the capability of providing it, but you've got a good enough contract that one, you can afford it, and two, you've got enough control over it to understand that when, you, when there is ability to claim fees, you can claim it, but it, while, without it being a sort of repetitive thing that is just every five minutes you're putting a mm. bill on the table. So I think there's a, sort of those sort of principles which give that should give the sort of atmosphere that says we're delivering architecture in a sound business environment. Yeah. And Does that sound... Yeah. Can, can, you, can you talk a bit more about, about the organisation of, of how the company is structured and yeah. the, things like the constitution and... Well, I, obviously... It's, it's a very unique yes, I mean, business structure. I mean, as, as I think is common, probably common, I don't know how commonly remember, you know, Richard has a strong moral and political focus, being a member of the Labour Party. But I think his, his, the, the, the social driver was saying, we need to give back to society something. If we're successful, we need to share that success with society. Mm. That was one thing. Two, he didn't want the business to be driving the the partner's reasons for being here. So there is no ownership. He didn't want any ownership of the practice, so you're buying and selling a partner's thing. So the, uh, on that basis, well, the construct has been that the, the practice is owned by a charity. And there is, and the sort of, the basis of it is, is the constitution which sets out how the business should be run, um, sets out things like salary levels or remuneration levels for the partners, which, which should be X times time the lowest paid architect. So it's limits, limits on that. 
it provides for the amount of the profits that go to the charity and how much that is shared out within the, the partners and mm. the partnership. Um, and it also sets a certain set, has a vision to abide it to what we should be doing for society. So that is essentially what remains as the basis of, of, of behind what the practice is. And that, that means obviously that the, you know, we choose, the partners are chosen, and when they leave, they leave, you know, and new partners take the place. There's no, there's no money involved in, in actually being a partner. Or as it's been, it's been a, a company one time, and we're now back to a partnership or a LLP. And that is a very strong driver and I think pervades the whole thinking within the practice. Mm. I think the whole question of community, you know, what we are, how we treat each other is very much linked to that. Is that the, 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 obviously we're a business, but we're a business with a, with, a, with a heart, if you like. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very obvious. I mean, like for me, my experience of working here, that yeah. the architecture does reflect, like the principles behind the architecture, like public space, yeah. the importance of having civic responsibility being at the heart of everything that's been mm. done. And also the way that business and design is conducted within the office mm. is kind of, there's a social element, a strong social element and a mm. connection about that, about, you know, this, the, the, the office is organised with social spaces. There's, mm. there's a strong culture of of meetings and of drinks and of coffee and of trips and of the, mm. these types of things that made mm. the place very, very mm. um, unique. And again, yeah, it's, it's interesting how that's reflected in the architecture mm. and the mode of business, mm. the way that it's done. No, I think there's sort of all the sort of key principles of transparency, you know, uh, legibility, as you say, the, the civic space. I, I, it's essentially also that and I think it's a strong driver that one thing is the, arch the architecture, but others people. And mm. I think in the end, you know, everything we do is for people. So the, 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 the individual person is as key driver as anything within, the, within what we produce and what we should be for. And, and how, how has, so since your, your you started here how from your perspective has the organization evolved what are the what are the main sort of changes? well obviously i think the big step was probably it's over 10 or 12 years ago now when you know richard sort of decided that that had he had to be thinking about generation change obviously you know the, the, the original partners already um I can't remember who was left by then, but the, of the original partners was already was diminishing, um, and the whole discussion of generation change arose, and ended ended up with the name change with Graham and Ivan coming onto the name and changing from RRP to RSHP, and I think that is this is by you know by far the biggest sort of change because while it was happening it 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 was you know the the um the, the actual change itself you know gave the office a whole new impetus of what that there you know there is a there is a future and i think this is this is the remarkable thing about richard is his vision his vision of of seeing that there if you if you wanted a continuity it had to be within the individuals. It was a sort of, you can argue either way or the other, you could have changed, he could have decided to call it studio this or studio that, and then it become a f more anonymous, but he felt strongly that it related, he, he wanted names to be the drivers behind it or individuals. Um, and you could say, we should now be thinking of what the next step is. Um, I have, have to sort of accept that I'm probably well behind, beyond my cell by date, date here. But um, so the next step is, is will be something, you know, bound to be something when I'm not here. <coughs> but 
that process, I think, has been been ongoing, and it's you know, it's never easy. Um, Richard isn't the person he is because he's been some soft soft touch, um, and you know, he's he's still been an extremely dominant person on the scene. Mm. I think the other major change, and it's it's interesting how how important it's it's been in in subtle senses, but physically very different was moving from Thames Wharf into the building here. Yeah, um, it's it's difficult to forget how radical it was to imagine where we were in that environment, Thames Wharf by the river, you know, in you know, sort of distributed in the buildings, but with the with the cafe and the whole environment out there, um, but which was a bit isolated because mm. you, know, you had to pull yourself together to go into town, <laughs> and a lot of our consultants, you know, were not there. Uh, and actually, interestingly, travel for a lot of people was a lot more difficult. Very easy for me because I, I was living sort of ten minutes away. Um, to coming into the city, into a building of our own design, um, in completely different environments, creating our own environment in the building on a single level. Um, a lot easier for most people to get here, funnily enough, because coming in, you get here a lot easier. But obviously not with the same uh, social spaces, etc. cetera. Um, but in our own environment here where we're all on one floor, we've got the uh, sort of central piazza space where a lot goes on. Uh, some of us have to travel along further, <laughs> some don't. Um, but I, it's, it's been very invigorating. I mean, personally, I, I, I definitely like it here because you can move around the office, well, it allows me to procrastinate a lot because I always find an excuse for not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but it's very visible, you know, and you, you know, particularly from my side of the business, when I want to talk to someone about something, I can very easily sort of just go and get information. Mm. So I think for, for me, and I think for most people, it's, it's a very positive environment. Obviously, it's it's a it's the sort of external social is perhaps a little more difficult, but I'm not the most best person to talk about social <laughs> things because I'm antisocial by nature. But apart from that, <laughs> um, I yeah, you know, and I think the other thing, just about continue on that theme, the third I think major step that's happened is is the new partners. Yeah, we've now got a range of new partners. Which, which I think has is, is been a very positive influence. Yeah. Um, they're not as, as timid as perhaps, you know, well, I've never been quite timid, but certainly one was, one was more dominated by Richard, Marco and John, you know, because um, they're more, more vociferous, they're more, more to say, they're mm. more involved. Um, and I think that is that um, has allowed a freeing up of discussion, um, and yeah, we've got some pretty big challenges ahead. But I think we're well equipped for it. And and how how has the methods that you go about winning work changed over the course of your your career? Well, I think I mean obviously, uh, well, what people now. <laughs> underestimate is how difficult it was to get to work at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. When when Pompidou finished, Richard had no work. Yeah, there was it was scrabbling around. And then there was Lloyd's, of course, which <coughs> kicked things off. Um, and then when I joined, it was only the first jobs in uh, we were getting, in France, there'd been one or two others, but there was nothing particular. Um, and it was very seesaw. Um, probably the sort of, the, the, probably the job that really 
kicked off the next phase of the practice was T5, which was a huge project. <coughs> At that time, Richard also was you know, far more in the public eye with all his work he was doing on, on, um, on cities, you know, uh, his political career. So, the, if you like, the practice profile was a lot more present and the sort of the T5 gave a big impetus to be able to do other work. We then obviously got invited into more competitions and you know, gradually the, the, our profile expanded. I, so in, in, I would say in all that period, it's probably been generated around Richard's notoriety, mm. if you like. But as gradually as you wing projects and the, the profile of the projects, you get on the list. And I think very much, yeah, I'll come to that further on, but there is the sort of star architect list. Yeah. And once you're on it, your name will crop up. <clears throat> and I think, that's, I think that's very definitely what's driven the practice for a long time. Mm. And, um, and it then depends how you take advantage of, which is, which, how you take advantage of that. And I think the particularity of, of RSHP, and I haven't got the sort of the statistic from other practices, is that we got a lot of work outside the UK. It has always been almost counter-cyclical, is that when there's a boom in the UK, we didn't particularly get work because, yeah, it was very commercial and you just go... Uh, but when, when, when things are more difficult, we got the work. And I think, you know, particularly in the UK and, the, and particularly with, with Graham's talents of, of getting exceptional planning mm. success on projects. You know, the, the ability to have a narrative that was, that was convincing to the planners instead of just reacting to what the planners say, that strength in the UK has been unique and it gave us some very important projects like this one, um, One Eyed Park. <coughs> so I think there's been that level of strength in the UK um, while obviously outside the UK it's been our ability to take advantage of the occasion of the opportunities that arose. France has always been a, again cyclical but we've back, been back in France a number of over the years it's almost like the seven year itch mm. it, it goes on and we're back in France at the moment very strong and Steve Barrett one of the new partners is is particularly active in France and and that's going very well. But we were in Germany, we've been in Monte Carlo, we you know, we're in South America, we've been in the Lebanon States, well. we've appeared in Lebanon. So I think it's again, it's back to the original question, yes, there's an appetite for it from some of us. Yeah. Um, you know, they find an invigorating opportunity. It's been a very good cushion in any form of of variations in the UK um, um, market and you know, over the time I would reckon on average there's never been less than 50% of our income and profits uh, have been coming from outside the UK and it's been right up to 70% or whatever it is and today it's pretty high too. I was, I was going to ask, you, you, you're talking about the, the sort of the ebbs and flows of, of the mm. economy and obviously RSHP has survived and weathered a number of economic storms mm. and this is often one of the kind of questions that comes up when I interview people about you know of, often the the recessions can change the direction of a business or mm. they can actually force a business to evolve and and develop new ways of practicing new ways of winning work mm. how have recessions forced RSHP to grow well but I, I think back to what I was saying before I don't th I think that because we've been there the whole time, yeah. it's the balance that's just changed over time. Obviously, we were all hit after the, with the financial crash, 
but and we we, we reduced, but um, at the same time, we were in a very strong cash flow position. So, yeah, we had to reduce, but we, from a business point of view, didn't affect our our business. And as I say, that we had a number of projects outside the UK, which which were very strong and, uh, and that delivered. So I think it's I I don't think it's ever changed our our business model. If if I because I don't think it, I don't sort of I don't really believe we've ever had a business model, but our, the way we did business because we've been we've always been strong outside the UK. Right. Yeah. Ever well certainly well from Poppy to was obviously the start, but. Um, you know, ever since I joined, that was on French work, and from then on, we've always had a steady stream of projects outside the UK, and you know, whether from luck or design, that's managed to fill in. You know, that balance has just shifted. You know, yeah. If it went down the UK, it went up outside. And I'm saying over the last 10, 15 years, it's been 50, 60 percent. Has always been from outside. <clears throat> emphasis today obviously is towards for for Asia and China you know we've just been presenting a project in in Vietnam Taiwan mm. you know. <clears throat> one time obviously we we were back in Australia but you know we did Barangaroo in Australia they're big challenges because obviously Australia's a long way away yeah um, but yeah that's I think that's what's meant that we've never had to sort of rethink our strategy it's just the emphasis changes and when you're working abroad how do you go about what are the sort of obstacles in setting up say a satellite office or the kind of offices that you might have to oversee projects like Barangaroo or the work that's been done in, in Shanghai that that how do you kind of begin to replicate something that's happening here and kind of Bring it to another. another well, country. I mean, at the end of the day, we don't. You know, um, I could say it's probably one of the challenges we will have to think about in the future. Rather, than, I think I think the future is probably the one that is the most challenging now with regard to business model. Um, we can talk a bit more about that, but up to now, the, it's been very clear that design is done here. Right. Um, we will set up a, you know, uh, you know exception to always prove the rule, but you know, Australia was such that we decided we had to, on that project was so big that we had to set up in Australia uh, to do that project. So we actually had 30 people at one point, 35 even one time in, in Sydney to do that project. But once it was done, that was it, we, you know. Aftar, who one of the associate partners is is still there, stayed on out there, and we hope we've now got this project in, in Melbourne, and we're hoping to build on that again. But that's why I come to the future is that we we will not be able to have a sustainable future in Australia running it from London. Yeah, and that's where the new challenges arise. Is I think that is. Model will be because as, as you know, Richard's no longer he's older than me. So yeah, there there's a new generation, and it will be a different operation from that point of view. And and I think that's the futures is a is something that we are have to address now. Yeah. As and it may mean more setting up locally, trying to face the challenge of. How do you have the ethos in a local office? The only office we actually, apart from the small small one in 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 Melbourne, it's actually Melbourne at the moment, <coughs> is Shanghai. Yeah. Um, uh, that's run by Ben Warner, who's who's been operating in Asia with us uh, for. 30, 40, I can't remember really years it is, he's but, you know, uh, um, who's, who's exceptional at, at running that business. Um, but it's the design is still done here, 
it's a you know the time frame to China is not as bad as 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 um, Australia. Um, but we are experimenting with doing more and more in Shanghai, and it just ebbs and flows. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we will it, we will see how that develops, and it very much depends on where you are because it, I'm rabbiting on here. But in Australia, even though they like the name, they want you there. Right. Yeah. There's this dichotomy between saying yes, I want RSHP, but I want them here. Yeah. And you'd face the same in the States. You know, one of our challenges in the States is that, generally speaking, yes, we'd love to have our SVHP, but I want you here. While China is, is, is different. Mm. Uh, it's, in one sense, it's, it's very often the opposite, saying, yes, I'd like a representative here. I want to be able to talk to someone, but I'm buying, you know, it's a bit, I don't want a false, you know, yeah, you don't want it to be like a, a franchise type of thing. It, yeah, the, it's, it's, you want the genuine article. It's yeah. a bit like when they buy a handbag. They want, they want to make sure that they, they actually bought it in Italy and they haven't bought it in, you know, in the... In the yeah, in it's, the, it's, it's authentic. Authentic, so, yeah. So do, you, do you think then that there is so a... That, that's that subtlety, which is... You, one shouldn't confuse the fact that where you're operating, you've got to really understand what you can do in each location. So you, you were saying, you know, RSHP has won a lot of work off, you know, being on, you were saying, talking about being on the list of Star yeah. and that actually has, you know, that obviously that comes with a lot of yeah. kind of collateral in terms of attraction and winning work. Yeah. Is there any downside to that? And how do you know when to say, how do you know when to say no to a project? Well, I think, well... It varies from time to time, and it varies how hungry you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one has to be fairly, fairly, fair, fairly open on that. Um, if I take my personal view, what is that? There are places I don't want to work, um, and I'll I'll take a very strong position on it until I say yes. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm never say you're never going to say. You know, you know, Places with well, I'm going to allow to say it on here, but I'm you know, and I just take an example. We worked in Korea, and I've always found Korea particularly difficult to work in, and I'm hesitant. But right now we're doing a competition stroke, you know, piece of work for Samsung. And so it's just, it's a more difficult place to work and I'm hesitant about it, but mm. if the right opportunity arises, you do it. Yeah. You know, today I'd be very hesitant about Russia because there's no legal basis of working in Russia, but a client might work in where, where you said, I said, well, why not? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's varies on the sort of scale of why you don't want to work places. Yeah. And obviously, the, the, yeah, the individual clients and their... And individual clients where you think it's, it's viable or not. The, that's in back, back to the star list. The challenges in the future is that that list is very long today. Yeah. You know, Sterling Prize in the UK, you, you've got a list as long as your arm now. <clears throat> so I, that's getting less easy to, you know, from, you know, we've been around a long time. Mm. Okay, you've got, you know, people like Big who, you know, be like Ingus has, you know, raced into the firmament. Yeah. Uh, so that'll always, you'll, you'll get some new names coming through, you know, who will take the limelight. Um, but we're still there. And I think what's interesting is as our, as our reference list gets longer, the consistency of that list and the quality of that list, I think is still our biggest marketing. Right. Point. Because you, you could say that we're not fashionable and we never have wanted to be fashionable. So, 
you know, form-driven architecture is not, a, you know, it's not what we do. Mm. You know, it's it's the it's the, it's the delivery of value, it's the delivery of quality, it's the delivery of of thinking. I mean, I think the us, you know, the, the strongest asset of this office is its ability to think mm. and to to reason about architecture. And I think that is that is a lasting quality. And if you look at our our list of projects, you know, I challenge anyone to find a dud project in there. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's that's what it's all about. And if we if we continue continue to do that, and that's not it's not the saying they have to be expensive project because I you know in fact our the the, the more cost driven ones are just as you know, just as good or if you know they're more legible than than when you can spend as much money as you like. Mm. So I think that, that continues to be the main thing. If we can we can continue to produce the sort of the, the quality that is that has been the hallmark of the practice, then we will remain, you know, relevant to clients in the future. Mm. And I think that is that is still it's recognised. Do do you have certain sectors or typologies of buildings that the RSHP would love to do and still haven't done yet? And what 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 have been the sorts of complications or the obstacles into moving into new sectors, even for a practice like RSHP? Well, I think um, infrastructure is definitely something where we haven't been strong, very difficult. We're, you know, we're learning some of the hard way in, in Melbourne on the Melbourne Metro at the moment. Infrastructure projects are very difficult because mm. it's a, it's to be blunt, I think it's a race to the bottom when it comes to putting teams together, fees, you know, it's all ticking boxes. Yeah. And it's a real shame because, you know, infrastructure is so important to the country and and it's always, you know, just take HS2, the budget's going. And why is that? I'd, I'd say a very big portion of that is the paucity of thinking behind, you know, the wrong people. Mm. <clears throat> so that's that's a, a challenge. Perhaps if I took another one, sports architecture, we've done not enough of. But it, but I think one of the challenges today is it's getting more and more based on your experience. So if you haven't got three stage yet, it's going to be difficult to get into. Um, we we had difficulty for a long time. Well, we fortunately we got into the, into into the medical side of it. You know we've. Done guys in St Thomas's. Yeah, so we're starting there. Uh, education is another one where we have a certain amount, but we want to push more. Yeah, so there are there are plenty of sectors where, you know, we would we would like to be more prominent, but yeah, at the, at the same time we're we're only a practice of 180, 190 people, so it's mm. limited to what it is. So well, 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 challenges that, are there all the time. Well, that, that's very interesting as well. How the practices manage to retain a fairly small size, particularly when you compare it to Foster's or yeah. Gensler size kind of practices, and and still remain very prolific in terms of of output. How has that been made possible? What's the sort of the secret sauce, well, if there is any? Well, I mean, I think. I mean, we always, and I, again, the future is, I think we have to modify some of this this talk, but we've always, I like to always use the term, we punch above our weight. And the, that is, as I say, back to the thinking behind what we're doing. Mm. Um, it's, it's, by, it's by the fact that because we've been we've been profitable, we've been able to invest. So we've always been, well, I said at the at the I always said the cutting edge and not the bleeding edge of technology. So we've ensured that every, that we've been you know we've got the systems in place so we can deliver what we need to deliver. <coughs> we've on, we've got a, you know incredibly dedicated bunch of people working here. So I think all that has meant that, in the end, we've always been able to produce the top end product. The fact that you know it's not fifty projects at the same time, but it's ten, yeah, is by the by because then the 
the pot is coming up. Mm. And as I said, there's none of it that we are ashamed of showing in the press. Has the practice ever used any other kind of ways of generating money, like in terms of developments or uh, been involved in, in, in like final equity of certain residential projects or perhaps doing their own, own developments? Uh, and unfortunately not. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when I see what we've managed to do for developers in the UK, particularly in getting them planning applications, if we'd had an overage deal on the extra two levels we got them, I would have retired long ago <laughs> to the Bahamas. Not the Bahamas these days, but <laughs> but um, no, I mean no. The answer is no. The only the only thing, yeah, the only s- minor side of it is as we've done one or two product developments where, in the end, we'd get. Um, it's the lighting. Yes, yeah, we've done the lighting. We've done things with trucks. Yeah, but that's those are minor bits. The answer is no. We've we've stuck to fees on designing buildings. Brilliant. Excellent. I think that's, I think we've just, we've nearly hit an hour, so that's best about time. Very so good. thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Absolutely fascinating good. insights. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Well, you're great. It's been a pleasure. Happy to do it. Brilliant. I enjoyed that as well. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.